Hi folks, so today I'm back on the island of Anglesey looking at this. This is the Anglesey Central Railway, a disused railway line which cuts through the island completely from south to north. So it branched off the main line down at Gera Wynn and ran for 17 and a half miles to the town of Amloch, providing a crucial link to what was historically one of Britain's busiest ports. And as you probably guessed, today I want to follow it from end to end, well as much as humanly possible anyway. But I also want to look at how it impacted the industry of the island of Anglesey and why this one was selected for the axe during the infamous beaching cuts. And then I want to see if there's any future for it. Could this old line be brought back into full restoration, either as a, a full passenger line or just a heritage railway which could boost the island's economy? And this is where it starts, branching off the main line just outside the little village of Gerwin. Not far from Juan Varicus Lingitko Gerichwin Drobachlantis Silio Gogogo. And from here it kind of loops round until it heads north. Right, so where I am now is the western end of the village of Gerwin next to the A55 which just runs over there. Now the line came down here, um, the station over there called the Holland Arms Station, named after the local pub. Um, there's no evidence of that left. It's actually all overgrown, the entire line between here and the, the where it branches off at Gerwin is completely overgrown, you can't get down there. So this is the closest I can get so far, but you can see evidence of it down here where there's a couple of rails still visible, but Heading north, you can see it's still overgrown for miles as well. So, what I'm going to do is go to go to the next village along and get try and get on the line up there. And also, back there where the station was, there's a tunnel under the A55 which you can't access. Believe me, I've tried. But anyway, there was a short branch line which went north east towards Red Wharf Bay, um, and unfortunately, there's nothing left of that because there's a scrap merchant here today. Um, but yes, a very short Red Wharf Bay branch started just down there. Right, so I finally got on the tracks just north of the village of Hlanigethny, somewhere called the Dingle, which is a natural gorge carved out by the river. Um, and as you can see, the railway line cuts right through, it follows the line of the river, follows the gorge north of the village of Hlanigethny. Um, so yeah, this is the Dingle, it's beautiful. Um, the Dingle, of course, is an English name for it. It does have an original name. Um, but yes, I'm on it now. So what I'm gonna do is keep going this way, northwards, and just see how far I can go. Just met a man actually who's um, walking the line as well. Uh, had a huge camera with massive lenses on it. Um, I said, oh, you're taking photos of the line? He said, no, I'm looking for adders. Apparently there's lots of adders along here. Um, so yeah, I've never seen an adder before, I don't think. Um, so that'd be interesting. I'd like to see one of them. Uh, it just occurred to me, just occurred to me, that um, although I kind of missed out the, the early first few miles of this line. It's still about 12 or 13 miles to walk um, and that's one way. Right so as you can see it's a single track line and it always was a single track line throughout its history throughout its length um, but it's in very good condition and that is simply because it was it's only been disused for about 30 years or so. Um, so yeah it's holding up well and it's nice to see it's nice to walk along this. Um, compared to other disused lines I've seen. Uh, so yeah, hopefully this will carry on. Right, so I'm now walking down the middle of a reservoir, the Hlun Um because the, the line crosses, there's an embankment that crosses the reservoir here. As you can see, this little bridgey bit, 
that's the main part of the reservoir over there. Turn around embankment, railway line. And there's the other bit over there and you can see the, the water coming through under where I'm stood now, this little bridge. Um, so yeah, very rare that actually a, a line crosses a, bo a body of water like this. Um, whoops, <laughs> don't fall in. It's quite choppy out there today, it's quite a windy day. Um, yeah, so cross the reservoir now and we're gonna keep going. Um, well, keep going, keep going, keep going. Fair few miles ahead. Um, the weather's holding out though, so that's quite good. Supposed to chuck it down today. Um, so yeah, lucky me. Yeah, so this reservoir was built in the 1960s, so a lot later on than the line was here. Um, for obvious reasons as well, to, to increase the water supply to the island. And so, um, what they did, they, they made sure that the, the reservoir didn't um, affect the line, obviously. Um, so, hence the bridge there where the water flows underneath the line. Um, so yeah, rather than the line being built across a reservoir, which is what it kind of looks like on a map, um, the reservoir was built around the existing railway line. Windy! <laughs> windy, windy. There's a, um, there's a station coming up though, in a, well, in a couple miles I think. Um, an intact station, so I give us something new to look at. <laughs> Right, so this is cool now. So I've come from that direction and I've come to Hlang Hwilhog. I'm definitely not saying that right. Station. Um, and it's almost perfectly intact. It's wonderful. Um, there's lots of little um, artifacts, if you want to say that. Yeah, it just looks like a station that's just had a fence put in front of it. I'm not sure if this is occupied. There's a pair of wellies outside and there's blinds on the windows. I'm not sure if somebody lives there. So there's a signal box up there. That's quite nice. Um, yeah, and you can see uh, the cutting, the, 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 the depth there. This is the old platform. Single track line, obviously. The old platform there. Um, yeah, what a cool little station. Anyway, I'm gonna keep going now, because I've got a long walk ahead. <laughs> I've come to another station now, um, and this one is a cafe, which thankfully is shut because it's Sunday today. Um, but yeah, very nice in a cutting as well. Um, however, I think I'm gonna have to get off now. My feet are killing me anyway, but I think I'm gonna have to get off the track because the track bed has become a little bit mushy, a bit mud muddy here. It has been for like half a mile or so. Um, but just looking at this beautiful little bridge here, I mean, there's a a date stone up there, 1866 it says. I don't know if that comes out on the camera. Um, but underneath this bridge, it's just a pool, of, it's just a swamp. <laughs> and um, you can see I'm gonna have to balance and walk across them rails. But then on the other side, it's completely overgrown. And um, I'm not sure I can get through there. Um, I'll give it a go, but I think I might have to get off here um, and try and find a way around via the streets. But anyway, I'm glad I got off here because there's an allotment down there and there's an old engine in there as well. Wow. Next to the crystal maze over there. Um, but yeah, old engine, very nice. Now on the morning of the 29th of November, 1877, heavy rain caused the dam of a mill near Lamer Kimed to breach and a surge of water washed away the wooden bridge over the river. The first train of the day included two coal trucks, a passenger coach and a guards van and the whole train went over the side of the bridge and into the river. The line opened in stages between 1864 and 1867. It was standard gauge, but also single track. So for much of its history, the twin fronted Fairley engines were used. A large part of its freight traffic came from the huge Paris Mountain copper mine. After the mine switched the majority of its exports from sea to rail, However, despite being one of the largest copper mines in the world at its peak, 
Paris Mountain was already in decline by the time it started using the railway. And in 1871, it closed for good. Right, it's gone really windy now. Um, so I've come off the railway and I've come to Paris Mountain, um, which is this vast alien landscape behind me. And <laughs> in its heyday, this was one of Europe's biggest copper mines. It was so successful, in fact, that it threatened the very economic viability of Cornwall's entire copper mining industry. But it's such a highly unusual place, Paris Mountain, because there's so many rare and precious metals all pretty much at the surface as well, including copper, which has been mined here since ancient times. It's so windy, I can't turn around because I've had to put the special microphone on for this kind of thing. Um, so I feel like a bit of a plonker. But if I turn around, it's just going to go flying. It's so windy behind me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's actually a beautiful landscape here. And it's not, it's kind of semi-natural. I mean, it is an old mine, an old quarry. But all these minerals are very close to the surface anyway. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just wonderful. I'll, I'll swing the camera around. Well, I'll do it now. Do it. <laughs> nice. Well, it's come off now. So the mine here really hit its stride in the 18th century when uh, copper from here was sent by sea to be processed in places like South Wales and Lancashire. So the copper here is actually pretty poor quality. It's known as copper oxide, but it's so close to the surface that that didn't matter. It was cheap enough and easy enough to extract that Paris Mountain became a huge importance to the country. Now there are very few, if any, photos of the mines actually at work on Paris Mountain because photography was still rare in the mid 1800s and nobody wanted to photograph something so working class as a mine in Wales. But there are some wonderful pictures made of the mines created by artists such as Julius Caesar Ibbotson, John Warwick Smith and Edward Pugh from the early 1800s. Although, as usual, Getty Images wants you to pay hundreds of pounds to use some of them, which is stupid because they were all engraved more than 200 years ago, and they're freely available in colour anyway. Aside from that, these pictures give us an almost fable-like image of what mining was like here. This fairy tale depiction can't hide the enormous amount of effort and ingenuity that had to go into extracting the minerals from the ground here. A mixture of open cast mining and underground shaft mining, Paris Mountain would have been a landscape of pure human effort. And you'll notice at the bottom of the mountain over here, there are several ponds and they're all artificial. They're all man-made. You can tell they're not natural, the square, the rectangle. Um, and that's because without going into too much detail to extract copper from copper oxide it has to go through several different processes. Um, and one of the best ways to, to do that extraction is to sit it in water containing a lot of iron, which is what these ponds were for. And of course we get at the top of the, the hill, the summit of the hill, this fabulous windmill which everybody is gravitating towards today um, and that was built in 1878 to supplement a steam engine so when the the, the open cast mine got down to a certain depth I think it was 100 feet they needed steam engines to haul the minerals out you couldn't do it by hand anymore it wasn't a viable option so they used steam engines however steam engines were super expensive so they built a windmill to supplement the energy uh, of the steam engines, which I've never heard of before. I've never heard of a, a windmill um, assisting steam engines. Um, so yeah, this is a, a case of it. And that uh, windmill had five sails, not four. Um, so yeah, wonderful. And I like that it's still there, even though it's not intact. Um, it's a good reminder of the industry around here. So every mineral from here was extracted and sent down the hill, down the mountain, to Anloch over there, 
on the coast to the north, which is where I'm going to go now because that's where the railway ends. So I'm going to join back onto the railway and find the end of the line um, if I don't get blown away first. The end of the railway line is the town of Amluk, which enjoyed a huge boom in the 18th century thanks to Paris Mountain. At the end of the century, it was the second largest town in Wales with a population of around 10,000 people. And it was thanks to the copper mine and the need to export the metal away from Anglesey that a port quickly developed here. And when the copper mining began to decline, and the railway stole a lot of the copper traffic anyway, the port shifted towards shipbuilding, which became the main industry here until the start of the 20th century. Right, so I'm now walking through the abandoned bromine uh, chemical plant, uh, the north end of Amluk. And um, yeah, this was built in the 1950s to extract bromine from seawater. And what they did, so they brought chlorine in from Ellesmere Port via the railway to here and used the chlorine to extract the bromine from the seawater. And uh, it's just this big abandoned place at the moment. It's just this huge abandoned chemical works, um, which you kind of can just walk freely in, even though you're probably not supposed to. Um, but it's just vast. I think I'm just going to keep walking to the far end um, and see what I can see. <laughs> So I'm in one such building and I'm not going to pretend to know what this is for and what I'm looking at but just look at this old um, machinery, this old technology, it's just wonderful. Age gone by, age gone by. Um, yeah, it's very windy outside, there's a lot of rattling going on. Um, but this is great. Uh, there's loads of buildings though, let's keep looking. So that bromine, once it was extracted, was then mixed with ethylene gas to make ethylene diabromide, which is used in many things, including pesticides and fire retardants and stuff like that. So this plant here, incredibly um, important, especially for the era it was, um, it was operational, the 50s, 60s, 70s. So the railway remained useful to Amlock um, all the way through until the 60s when the Beeching Cuts Axe claimed another victim and um, all the stations were closed and the line was only used for this chemical plant all the way up until the 1990s. But in 1993 the chemical plant started using road haulage instead of rail haulage and so the, the line became redundant and of course it was abandoned. So around 93 and 94 the line I've been following all day was just abandoned. So what of the future? Well, since it closed in the 1990s, local groups have been trying to get it restored, either as a fully formed passenger railway once again, or a heritage railway that we see around this part of North Wales, which is definitely beneficial to the local economy. And from what I've seen today, you ask, if, is it suitable to do that? I think so, definitely. I mean, from what I've walked along today, it's pretty much intact, it's entire length. The only problem really being the vegetation, which can easily be cut back with a bit of willpower. Uh, but most of the course is flat. The track bed is, is mostly intact. There are few, uh, bridges are few and far between. Um, so it's, it's, it's an easy one. I think this is an easy one. Um, and that's also the reasons why Sustrans have um, put forward a, a, an idea to make it into a cycle track. And it might just be possible to squeeze a cycle path right next to the restored railway as well, maybe. I mean, imagine being able to cycle the length of Anglesey without having to touch a road. I mean, the roads around here are country roads, farm roads and stuff. They're not great for cycling on. 
Imagine being able to do that and then hopping on a train back to where you started. Amazing. But on the other hand, this restoration talk has been going on for 30 years. And as we all know, without the political will, these talks just keep, these ideas just keep going on and on, regurgitating through different local politicians and different groups, but nothing really happens. So for now, this wonderful Anglesey Central Railway remains part of the history books. Um, and it will remain that way for the foreseeable, just like this fantastic abandoned chemical plant and a wonderful ancient Paris mountain. But yeah, that's it. So I've reached the end of the line, uh, another end of a, another line, and uh, that's it. Yeah, what a wonderful walk. The weather's cleared up a bit. It's, uh, it's been windy, it's still very windy, um, and it's been rainy, but you know what, it's all right. And look at this, look at that view. Look at that view, Irish Sea, beautiful. And a bit of blue sky as well. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching. And uh, I'm going to see you in the next one. Bye.